and welcome to today's EBEC accredited webinar from the ISCP's A to Z of CV pharmacotherapy series. And today's program will be focusing on inclusion and a jab going a long way. My name is Doreen Tan and I'm an Associate Professor with the National University of Singapore Department of Pharmacy and I'll be moderating the webinar today. I'm joined by Dr. Critin Banditanko. He is a pharmacist from the Chula Longkorn University, Thailand, and he will join me in moderating as well. Critin, over to you. Hi, everyone. Okay, so it is with pleasure that we are joined today by a fantastic psychology. Professor Christoph Filipiak, Rector of the Medical University of Marie Curie in Warsaw, Poland. Hi, Dr. Filipiak. Okay, then we have Professor Bernard Van Jung Shu, Professor in Cardiovascular Therapeutics and Head of the Division of Cardiology at the University of Hong Kong. Hi, Professor Shu. Hello. And we have Dr. Alberto Lorenzetti, who heads up the Lipid Clinic and Cardiovascular Prevention in the Hospital Cordoba, Argentina. Hi, Dr. Lorenzetti. Hi. Thank you, everyone. So we're very privileged to have a nice panel of speakers, very experienced, and I'm sure we're all going to be enjoying ourselves learning a lot about Inclusion this evening. Today's broadcast is brought to you by the International Society of Cardiovascular Pharmacotherapy, or ISCP, and of course, in collaboration with the Radcliffe Cardiology team. This is going to be a very interactive session with two real-world cases that we'll discuss, and we'll toggle, we'll toggle that with questions and answers. So if you look at the uh, little box at the bottom of your screen, please feel free to submit your questions to the faculty by, via the question module on the webpage. And we'll endeavor to answer as many of them as possible towards the end of the broadcast. So before we begin today's session, let's have a quick look at our learning objectives for this evening. Okay, um, the learning objectives for this evening is also on the website and we should be able to uh, go through that learning objectives also on the website. All right, so I'd like to hand you over to Professor Filipiak, who is going to be presenting to you all about Inclusion. So let us put our hands together to welcome Chris. Hello, everybody, once again, a warm greeting from an early afternoon Warsaw in Poland. And it's my great pleasure to give a short introduction on Inclisiran, the drug that is the hero of our today meeting. I will start with a potential conflict of interest. And my first point that I would like to touch is the times that we are living in. I would say that we are living in a new era of pharmacotherapy. I mean, the drugs based on RNA or mRNA uh, technology, and Inclisiran is one of them. Why I'm saying that we are living in, in such an era? Because, uh, well, from pharmacological point of view, you could say that we have at least four classes of different pharmacotherapy uh, on different drugs which are based on RNA. I mean, uh, the most uh, probably popular now are, of course, um, uh, mRNA products. I mean, uh, billions of them have been given as a Moderna on Pfizer BioNTech COVID anti COVID vaccinations. So, in fact, uh, I would say not millions, but billions of uh, people all over the world are treated with uh, this kind of uh, mRNA uh, products. Uh, there's another class uh, that we will not deal today, RNA uptamers. There are very short fragments of RNA, and we have one, in fact, drug registered nowadays in ophthalmology since uh, uh, 2004. And there are two classes of drugs that are important for lipidology and will be important for lipidology. Uh, we are saying that there are SENS or SIRANS. SIRANS, uh, the name comes from uh, this uh, short interfering RNA, and this is the hero of our uh, today talk, I mean, in Clisiran, but there are also products which are uh, based on anti-SENS oligonucleotide 
RNA. And uh, we are saying get a sense because uh, all of the international names of those drugs uh, have the ending RSN. So you probably remember that the first SEN was uh, Etepirsen, registered in Duchenne dystrophy, then was uh, Golodirsen, Vitolarsen, and Nusinersen. So a lot of drugs uh, uh, that change uh, the history of spinal muscular uh, atrophy treatment. Uh, so uh, this is a proof that we have a lot of new discoveries in pharmacotherapy in RNA technology. So let's come to serums because we will be talking today about uh, Incli serums. So what for are serums made? And uh, there is a, I would say, an era of serums and a lot of serums are coming for different indications because uh, you probably have seen from the very first uh, film animation just before we started our meeting, that the idea is quite simple, that you uh, just act on um, mRNA, and mRNA can be mRNA for different proteins, for different genes, and, and therefore you could uh, think about a lot of different diseases not connected with each others in which serums will be uh, very important drugs. Nowadays, there are some serums tested in ophthalmology, there's one serum tested in nephrology, there are some uh, serums tested in hematology, in dermatology, there are a lot of serums tested in uh, oncology. And also there's a lot of serums tested, uh, which are the serums, uh, I mean, which act on liver. And one of them is in Cliceran, because you have seen that this mRNA uh, that is uh, touched by in is an MRI uh, which must be delivered to the hepatocyte. So Inclisiran is one of those 22, or maybe now it's about 30 different serums tested in, in, in this uh, kind of uh, diseases. Well, from historic, historical point of view, of course, uh, not cardiovascular pharmacotherapy was the first one that was uh, mm, uh, the part in which uh, serums were registered. Uh, you remember probably that the first serum ever registered but FDA was Patti serum. So this was the first serum that was registered and it was registered in amyloidosis uh, patients and uh, some other serums for this indications also now available. As for serums, uh, now FDA has uh, registered three of them, Patisiran, Givosiran, Lumasiran. Inclisiran was registered firstly in Europe by European uh, Medical uh, Agency, but a lot of other serums are waiting in a queue to be registered in USA and in Union, uh, European Union and all over the world. And when you look at those different serums, you can see that some of them are really so-called breakthrough. Uh, therapy. So the therapy for the indications that has never been addressed uh, from a uh, uh, pharmacological point of view uh, before. And these are uh, such, uh, such uh, indications like hyperoxaluria, for example, some kind of amyloidosis uh, or acute hepatic uh, porphyrias. All these states can be addressed uh, with uh, serums. And of course, the hero of our talk is Inclisiran, which was registered in hypercholesterolemia. I said that uh, a lot of experts, and I agree with those experts, are saying that serums and SERS, in a sense, will be most important drugs in the future lipidology. And to prove uh, this statement, I, I will come to the Inclisiran. Inclisiran, you remember that it's a uh, let's call um, a set step, a set stage of uh, treatment in hypercholesterolemia after starting azetamide. Uh, we have Inclisiran, but we also have some uh, monoclonal antibodies which are also using, uh, being used uh, and uh, uh, registered for uh, PS, uh, PCSK9 uh, modulation. Uh, in fact, Inclisiran is the newest uh, technology and uh, of course, Inclisiran is not the only 
attitude, pharmacological attitude to lipidology, because uh, scents are also being registered or will be registered in a moment. And I will just remind you that, for example, we are very advanced with clinical trials with pelacarsen, so resen, not serum. So now, Inclisiran is registered in lipidology, but maybe in a few years, uh, Pelacarsen will be registered, which will be a very important in lipidology in um, reducing lipoprotein A. I put it on a, one slide because, in fact, if you think about uh, serums on, uh, or recents, the technology is very similar, but one is uh, uh, based on so-called small interfenic RNA, and second technology is, uh, is uh, based on antisense oligonucleotide. But in fact, the outcome of this technology is uh, the same, that you block mRNA, so you, in fact, uh, you block the protein that is based on this uh, specific mRNA. Uh, well, uh, those serums are also very important in lipidology in, in, in tomorrow lipidology, not only RSANS as far as you consider, for example, a reduction of uh, lipoprotein treatment. And I must uh, remind you about uh, recently, uh, recently published uh, Apollo trial from American College of Cardiology this year, uh, in which one of the serums, it doesn't have a, a name, it's uh, SLN360, but it's uh, very uh, similar to Olpa serum, another serum which is being evaluated uh, in uh, lowering lipoprotein A, and you probably know that these are very effective serums because uh, they can produce even 90 80% uh, reduction in lipoprotein A. Well, I would uh, uh, put a thesis that, uh, well, all this uh, RNA technology drugs will be the future of lipidology. And uh, we, maybe even in the future, will get off all the old drugs, which for me are, uh, are for example, monoclonal antibodies like evolucumab or alirocumab. Uh, that's uh, something uh, that illustrates how quickly this uh, pharmacotherapy progress is uh, uh, really taking place because I'm uh, talking about old drugs which are in fact not very old. I mean, evolucumab and alirucumab are also very, uh, very sufficient and very effective and, uh, and, and very new drugs. But uh, I do believe that they are uh, really um, uh, will be, uh, we get rid of them uh, and uh, new drugs uh, on RNA technology uh, will be more popular. I mean, serums like Inclisiran. Why I'm saying about this? Because uh, when you look at the other uh, fields of lipidology. For example, we have new uh, drugs uh, which uh, affect uh, ANGPTL3, and these are quite important drugs to lower, for example, triglycerides. And you probably know that we have a, a very uh, a new drug registered in USA, Evinacumab. Uh, and nowadays we have some uh, data that uh, probably better one and uh, more cost effective even will be a uh, uh, Vupa Norsen. So as you see, uh, Resen and Serans will replace, in my opinion, all drugs, I mean monoclonal antibodies. Now, coming back to Inclisiran, what is for, what is uh, what is uh, evidence-based medicine for using Inclisiran and how we uh, do in practice, how we do in practice, we will see in clinical cases that we discussed today. But uh, first of all, the mechanism of action, I, I think I don't have to go into details after this uh, beautiful animation film, which we have seen just before the starting. Uh, you remember that it's a small interfering RNA. Uh, so in fact, uh, it, uh, this uh, inclisiran, uh, after um, coming into hepatocyte, will incorporate uh, into RNA-induced silencing complex. And the result will be that uh, this specific mRNA for PCSK9 will be cleaved and the 
there will be inhibition of uh, PCSK9 synthesis and a very long uh, acting inhibition because it's acting half a year. So almost six months uh, uh, effect after such uh, uh, single uh, dose of this drug. Of course, we have now new guidelines. I'm from Poland, so I must uh, follow European Society of Cardiology guidelines. These are the guidelines that we follow in Europe. And uh, the newest uh, version of this European guidelines, uh, 2021, is of course introducing Inclisiran into clinical practice. And you can read from these guidelines that Inclisiran will reduce LDL cholesterol, uh, something about 50, 55%. Well, uh, how it comes that we know that it's uh, in uh, reducing LDL cholesterol by uh, 50 or 55%. Uh, when you look at the data, it's really like that. I mean that the mean uh, uh, reduction rate is 50, 55%. But I would like to uh, draw your attention to the efficacy from different trials uh, at uh, day 180, so after six months. And you can see that there are even some patients in which we reported a reduction of LDL cholesterol uh, of 80 uh, percent, not 50. So 50 is a mean uh, value, but there are some even individual patients in which uh, Inclisiran uh, can reduce LDL cholesterol after single uh, uh, single jab uh, of 80 uh, percent, and this effect is half a, a year. Uh, I must say that this uh, mean effect, 50 percent reduction, is of course. Uh, uh, effect which is much uh, uh, stronger than statin effect. You have such a comparison on my uh, slide here. Uh, and uh, what's more important, uh, it can be seen also in monotherapy. So it's very important that even in patients which are totally statin intolerant, uh, you can imagine that you can uh, give only in run and reduce LDL cholesterol uh, above uh, 50%, which means that for a patient with high, on the very high risk, a cardiovascular risk, you can think even about monotherapy of in run in the future. Now, what we know about uh, clinical trials, you have uh, such a slide here. Uh, we have a lot of clinical trials uh, with Inclisiran. This is a series of clinical trials with acronym uh, Orion. And uh, we know from those Orion trials that has been ended, uh, that a, 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 a drug is uh, really uh, very uh, efficient, uh, that uh, there are no evidence for a different uh, side effects, what is uh, very important. Uh, and uh, so the safety of the drug is also uh, very uh, uh, good. Uh, I know that uh, some experts are saying that we still uh, lack uh, uh, Orion trials with heart endpoints. Uh, so the proof that in Clisiran where prolonged life uh, will reduce uh, myocardial infarction, will reduce stroke. But uh, as we know, as the drug uh, lower LDL cholesterol to this extent, we can make such exploration. But uh, uh, on the other hand, we have some other trials that will be ending in uh, next year or two years or three years. And we, those trials have a lot of patients uh, and have also so-called uh, heart endpoints. Uh, I tried to, to calculate all these trials and uh, those trials which are coming soon are uh, the trials that involved over 70,000 patients and those trials are being um, uh, conducted in over 50 uh, countries and these are typical trials in secondary prevention or in primary prevention. So we will have definite answer that this drug uh, will lower, I do believe, uh, all the traditional endpoints like in a big uh, statin, for example, uh, trials. So uh, what is uh, my prediction uh, uh, for the future of this in Clisiran and uh, on, on this use in clinical practice? Sorry for the slide. Let's uh, uh, 
uh, treat it as a, a little a lesson in, in Polish language because I didn't have time to translate it from Polish. But uh, I do believe that you understand the slide. Uh, it's saying that, for example, if you look from the patient point of view and if you are using statins, you need to uh, at least to swallow uh, 365 tablets a year. If you have a PCSK9 a monoclonal antibody like alirocumab or evolucumab, you at least need 26 uh, jabs a year. And now we are here, we have Inclisiran, and in fact, you can treat patients with two jabs a year. So if here you have adherence, it means that uh, adherence is the answer. Uh, I don't know if we can have uh, something better. Maybe something better will be a vaccination once uh, alive uh, uh, for anti-sclerotic, anti-atherosclerotic vaccination or anti-PCSK um, vaccination, but now it's only a dream of the future. So as for now, I would state that in Clisiran, is the, has the highest adherence rate among all uh, drugs used in hypercholesterolemia. And that would be my uh, introduction. Thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you so much, Chris. We'll now go over to a time where we'll discuss two real world questions. Just a reminder to the audience, please post your questions to the bottom of the page and then we will collate everything and discuss together with the panel later on. Maybe I'll just pass the time over to Critin for him to take the first case and let's see what our experts think about the first case. Okay. So the first case, so you could see that Mr. SS, 26 years old, and with for acute Curry syndrome. So he report acute dyspnea and chest pain with radiate to the jaw one hour before the EMS brought him to emergency department. His past medical history included a single vessel disease about five years ago. Uh, treat with the dark lighting stent to the mid uh, left circumflex, diabetes, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. So uh, his medication right now is aspirin, 25 milligram daily, clopidogrel, cafedalol, uh, 12.5 BID, anaropril, 10 milligram BID, etoastatin, 40 milligram plus acetamide, Metformin, 1,000 mg BAD, glipizide, 5 mg daily, and omeprazole, 20 mg daily. So because uh, in Thailand, uh, we have like a national drug list and uh, universal coverage. So the government will pay for some medication. So in Thailand, the aspirin dose we use uh, modestly about 25 to 100 mg per day. And... Uh, STLT2 inhibitors or the GR, GLP1 receptor RA is not included in our national drug list like now, right now. So our patient, uh, most of the time they will get metformin and uh, sulfonylurea. Okay. Uh, at ER and CAT lab, the ECG show new SCD press and lead V1 to V4. Uh, the troponin is positive. Actual cam show 90% occlusion at mid LAD, so it's a new occlusion. And the echo show regional wall motion abnormality with the uh, EF about 52%. So if we uh, look at to his LDL level, so on January, his LDL level fell 85 milligram per day lit. About three months later, it's rising. So on that time, uh, the doctor <clears throat> prescribed acetamide for him on March. And then after that, his LDL level is declined. On June, it's declined to about uh, 85 again, and other parameters quite uh, not that bad. So he's not pressure about 130 over 25. Uh, his A1C is about 7.4%. Uh, HDL is about 42, non HDL level is 128. So, uh, this admission about September. 
before he scheduled to see he scheduled to see his cardiology. Uh, you could see that his LDL is still about 80, but still above the target uh, based on the ESC guidelines should less than 55. So his LDL is still above the target that we would like to bring it down. Okay. So, okay, from the first case, I think uh, the question, we will move to the Q&A question. So Doreen, please. Thank you, Kritin. So maybe let's ask um, uh, Alberto first. Alberto, what do you think about this particular gentleman here? Would you have added on uh, Inclusiran? Would you have added on the PCK, PCSK9 inhibitor, increased the statin? What would you have done with this man? Uh, thank you, Doreen. This is a typical secondary prevention patient that we usually see in the real world. The, the thing could be, we, we can uh, uh, think about uh, his uh, goals in, in terms of LDL, maybe less than 55 according to European guidelines, but also maybe less than 40 because he has a recurrent event. Uh, in this particular case, I, uh, I do not consider increased uh, statins because we, in this patient, we, we do not uh, achieve the, the goals. Probably the best option is uh, use inglycerin or if it's not possible, uh, PCSK9 inhibition with a monoclonal antibody, because in, in, in some publication, we have seen that more than 80% of the patient on the statins uh, achieve to a European goal with addition of PCA's Kinan uh, intervention, maybe monoclonal antibody, but for the reasons that Dr. Uh, uh, the speaker has uh, shown to us, the adherence is really, really uh, probably the, 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 the best use in inclusion. I definitely uh, will add, if it is my patient, inclusion in this, in, this, uh, in, uh, in this patient. Thank you, Alberto. Um, let's ask uh, um, uh, Bernard. Uh, Bernard, what do you think about this uh, effects of inclusion since uh, Alberto has decided? Um, do you know of whether inclusion has got pleiotropic effects like statins? My goodness, that's a very difficult question. Uh, I think in, in, because it's, it's quite new, um, but uh, preclinical studies actually have shown that uh, uh, inclusion may have potential pleiotropic effects like statins, and and you know they are they they seem to be very favorable. I mean things like uh, reduced um, uh, oxidative uh, products, uh, you know, better endothelial function, less platelet aggregation, um, and fewer expression of uh, let's say inflammatory cytokines. So these are all very favorable um, uh, effects if they you know, if they do occur in our treated patients, um, I mean, that would be very good because, I mean, you know, if you have platelet aggregation, if you have, if you have oxidative stress, if you have endothelial dysfunction, if you have, um, uh, have expression of inflammatory cytokines, then, you know, that creates the milieu, the environment for atherosclerosis to progress and for thrombo thrombo uh, thrombotic events to occur. So, but then, of course, uh, you know, this is, uh, at the moment, this is very much, um, you know, basic science level. Um, but it will be interesting to see if these uh, potential pleiotrophic effects, plus the amazing ability to lower um, uh, LDL cholesterol, as well as, you know, LP little A and, and a little bit of triglyceride as well, uh, whether this translates into reduction events, uh, from uh, Professor Philip Yek's um, talk, uh, Christoph, uh, uh, you know, it was was very hopeful that you know these will be um, these benefits will be borne out in the uh, long term trials that are ongoing. So, 
Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. Um, my screen is suddenly gone blank and I can't see anyone else. So if you wanted to say something to me, please. Oh, okay. Now I can see people. Very good. Uh, hi, everyone. See you again. <laughs> okay. So I think there were other questions regarding uh, the wonderful role of Inclusion. And maybe I should pose this question to say, um, Chris. Chris, I think there were questions about whether uh, Bampedoic acid, uh, is this better than Bampedoic acid? Um, and also, how do we predict the response of Inclusion for each patient? Uh, is it going to be like every single person that it will work for? And would it be unnaturally interfering with proteins that could cause genetic mutations? You know, at the, at the start of the COVID vaccination, everyone was like, oh, worried about um, uh, the MRA vaccine, right? How it could cause genetic mutations. Did you have comments about that? Oh, I'm afraid Chris might be frozen. All right, maybe we'll get uh, Alberto to answer the question. Yeah. Is it better than bampedoic acid? And is it always predictable for every yes, single the, person? Uh, the, the bampedoic acid is a very interesting drug. Uh, um, uh, the, the bampedoic uh, acid reduces the production of the cholesterol synthesis uh, upstream to the uh, to the action of the statins, uh, and particularly, it's very interesting because uh, the the action is uh, focused in, in uh, at the hepatic level. Uh, we do not foresee uh, muscle uh, contraindication or muscle uh, secondary uh, effect uh, using bempedoy, but it's uh, like I, I would say weak. Uh, drug in terms of LDL reduction. I mean, 20% at the most, uh, 15, 18% at the at the most in in terms of LDL reduction. But it's very interesting uh, to use in combination with a cetimibe or even with a statins. But in both cases, uh, we do not uh, expect so. Uh, so much uh, LDL reduction. It's, it's, it's a different drug. It's an interesting drug. The, the, the um, uh, uh, cardiovascular out outcomes trial is just finishing. I suppose, as uh, doc uh, Dr. Philip Pack uh, said to us, every intervention that reduces LDL probably reduce for sure, I, 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 I think, uh, maize. But we, we have to uh, wait several months up to have the clear outcomes result. But uh, in summary, it's an interesting drug. It's an oral drug. This is a main difference. Once a day, 180 milligrams. But it's quite different. It's less, less potent than any PCSK9 intervention. I mean, monoclonal antibodies or in glycerin. It's, 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 it's different. Uh, we can combine, but uh, we cannot expect a strong reduction in terms of LDL uh, uh, reduction. Many thanks, Alberto. I, I, I uh, nice to have you back, Professor Filipiak. We we're yeah, posing yeah. you a question. Yes. yes. Um, uh, could you uh, maybe sorry, take you, the you question? Haven't, you haven't heard me. I, I, I suppose mm -hmm. I had a, a short... Uh, uh, weak internet. Uh, uh, well, I do agree with uh, with uh, all the, the facts that Alberto said, but uh, I would say that uh, the main problem with bempedoic acid is that it uh, it lacks uh, clinical trials. They are just finishing, but nowadays they, they are lacking, and it's uh, quite important because uh, when you look at the mechanism of action of bempedoic acid, I would say that it's drug competing with uh, statin. So uh, rather, I would uh, say that it can replace in some uh, uh, clinical scenario statin. And uh, uh, probably you will agree with this because when you look at the pharmaceutical companies, they are investing also in a combo uh, and bempedoic uh, acid with ezetimab. So they are trying to say us that it's uh, alternative to the combo statin as a type. So I, 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 I think that we must uh, uh, wait for clinical trials and uh, uh, it will be very hard uh, for bempedoic acid to compete with statins. 
I mean, the drugs that are so widely uh, uh, just evaluated in clinical trials. But it's really quite interesting uh, thing. And, uh, you know, it's like a history of pharmacology. Uh, if uh, Bempedoic acid was first, not statins, I would say that it would be better drugs than statins. But it's second, so it arrived later, and uh, I think it will not be the miracle drug. So in summary, we're still in favor of Inclizaran. Mm -hmm. One for Inclizaran, less for Bempedoic yeah, yeah, acid. Samson. Yes. Yes, Alberto. Uh, also, uh, there is a, a secondary effect in terms of, uh, not, not always, but it's a possibility in terms of uh, uric acid elevation with, with the chronic use of benpedoic acid. It's, a, it's a, a little problematic drug, in, uh, as Dr. Philip Park said, is uh, the, the main focus is uh, starting intolerant patients. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Alberto. Uh, we don't have bampedoic acid in Singapore, I don't think, so I'm not that familiar with it, but I think that's a good call because a lot of our patients with high cholesterols are likely to also have metabolic syndrome and they're probably uh, bad eating habits with gout and all that. So the, the elevation of the uric acid, I think it's an important observation to be making about the bampedoic acid. Talk to us, Bernard, about the uh, the ability of Inclusiran with respect to working for every single person. Do you think uh, this is predictable for every single person? And what do you think about the comment that it could cause genetic mutation, just like the mRNA uh, vaccines for COVID? Oh well, thank you very much, Doreen, for the, for for uh, those questions. Uh, well, does it work on on everyone? Um, probably better than most drugs that we know about. Because uh, it's very strange because uh, if you have an oral drug, uh, once you dispense it, uh, you know, I, I know you're a very good cardiovascular pharmacist, you can persuade your patient to have near 100% compliance, but most patients in, real, in the real world may not take um, all you give them. So I think it's something that's injectable and better still, injected at erect so it's a quite long intervals, uh, you're going to get 100% or near 100% compliance. So I think on that count alone, um, Inclusiran has the advantage over traditional therapy. And uh, in clinical trials also, the, um, the uh, lipid lowering effect seems to be quite consistent. And um, well, it's based on um, silencing RNA technology. And that's very, actually, very, um, very precise technology, unlike, you know, small molecules uh, where, you know, you worry about off-target effects. So, um, so it does appear that, uh, it, you know, really, um, it, it's very, in fact, very specific. Uh, would it uh, cause genetic mutation? I hope not. Um, and, and as uh, Professor Philip Yek, um mentioned just now, I mean, you know, we worried about uh, you know, COVID, MR, mRNA COVID vaccines, you know, causing mutations and all sorts of, you know, um, perhaps even cancer and, and such like, uh, but, but we haven't observed it after, you know, billions of doses. So um, it's too early. I mean, you know, the long-term trials of Inclusion are ongoing. Too early to say whether there are some, you know, unsuspected uh, long-term adverse effects, but the short, short or medium term adverse effect profile is just very, very impressive because it's so specific. Now, compared to, we were talking about uh, bampedoic acid just now. So, I mean, it may affect the uric acid level. It may affect your blood count. Uh, it may also have, you know, other side effects as well, which again, in the sort of lipid lowering world, um, well, statins are very exceptionally well tolerated. And, and then, you know, there comes along bampedoic acid where, where we have to worry about, you know, adverse effects. And, and, and then on top of that, you know, it's uh, LDL lowering effect is rather modest. So bampedoic acid is, is an interesting drug. It may have its own niche for statin intolerant patients, but, but you know, uh, it's not really for the majority of patients. Whereas something like Inclisaran seems to be suitable for, you know, uh, you know, wide range of patients, perhaps those who are absolutely afraid of needles. So if you ask, you know, them for, to come back for injections, they'll stay away from your clinic, then perhaps, you know, those patients can, can you know, um, go on 
take oral drugs alone. But otherwise, I think in future, this is a very exciting development. Thank you, Bennett. I think there were a few comments about whether we need to worry about myocarditis. That doesn't seem to be a concern, according to uh, the report so far. There was also um, questions about how you think you monitor this uh, patient. So I think we talked about Mr. SS earlier, and I think Alberto had elected to add on in glycerin for Mr. SS. Uh, I just wanted to pose a question to Professor Filipiak. Do you think that it will make sense at all to combine glycerin together with a PCSK9 inhibitor? From the way that it worked, I mean, the uh, the financial considerations aside. No, no uh, as I understand your question, uh, first of all, you cannot mix in Cliciran with uh, PCA K9 inhibitors. Yeah, this is the same group of drugs, the same mechanism of action, or very similar. So, in fact, uh, you must uh, go into one or other. I do believe that enclisiran is better because it has better adherence, it's more selective. And also, you are discussing some uh, potential adverse reaction. And uh, in fact, uh, from pharmacological point of view, uh, always uh, monoclonal antibodies have the potential of causing uh, some kind of immunological reaction and you don't have it is with serans. So in fact, I would say that all these drugs uh, based on RNA technology uh, will in fact replace uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies that I, that, that what I was saying in my introduction. But uh, there's a second uh, reason for uh, such a thesis. Uh, and you know what the reason? The reason is that when you talk to uh, pharmaceutical company experts, they are saying that, in fact, serans and sirsans are cheaper in uh, production than monoclonal antibodies. We don't see it now when the new drugs are coming to the market because the prices are usually the same as uh, class drug, I mean, PCSK9 inhibitors, but I do believe that in fact, uh, the cost of production of serans and serans are really uh, cheaper than monoclonal antibodies. Thank you. Um, does anyone think there's a need to even monitor for the therapy at all? I mean, aside from the fact that someone is compliant to inclycerin, it sounds so safe that there doesn't seem to be a need to give the patient a close TCU to, to watch them. Bernard? Uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, officially, there's no need to monitor anything other than the uh, the lipid profile or the cholesterol level to ensure compliance or you're not over-treating the patient. Um, but I imagine in the real world, uh, you will be monitoring these patients uh, um, for other reasons, such as if they are already on a statin, then you might want to do some, uh, let's say, maybe liver function or muscle enzyme from time to time, if it's indicated. And if they're diabetic, you monitor the diabetes in the, in, in the usual way. So in fact, going back to our patient, I mean, not only uh, do we need to treat um, his, uh, his cholesterol, uh, we should also uh, treat his uh, hypertension as well as diabetes better. But that's another story altogether. Uh, if we have time, we may go back to that. But but perhaps I think there's a, another case coming up. Is that right, Doreen? That's right. You're spot on. So I think we were having quite a good time discussing about the profile of Inclizarin for the first case. I'll give the time back to Critton for him to introduce the second case to us. And this is going to be a lady, I think. Okay, so sorry. Okay, on the first case, we talk about the case who have like a secondary prevention, who have like a recurrent acute core syndrome. So the second case, uh, maybe uh, a little bit more complexity because we talk about like a primary prevention for the high risk patient. So Mrs. TD, 65 years old, she's seeing her cardiology. Okay, she report about slight tiredness sometimes, especially during heavy exertion. Her past medical history included diabetes for 20 years and she already developed nephropathy and peripheral neuropathy. 
hypertension, non-familial hypercholesterolemia, gout, and obesity. Her medication included as free low dose, uh, Lonsartan 50 mg daily, uh, amlodipine 10 mg, hydrochlorothiazide 25 mg, etoastatin 40 mg, metformin 1 g, BID, cetacliptin 50 mg daily, mecobalamin, gabapentin for her neuropathy, and allopurinol for her gout. Okay, so her LDL level, typically an uncontrolled lady. So sometimes more than 100, sometimes below, just a little bit below 100. So the last visit on the May, her blood pressure is quite high, 150. Uh, her blood sugar is uncontrolled, A1, uh, A1C is 20.8 percent, fasting blood sugar is 150. Uh, Slam green is 1.8, so her EGFI is about 28 per 28, okay. And her LDL is about uh, 108. Okay, so this, this visit, three months later, uh, still high blood pressure, uncontrolled blood sugar. And right now her LDL level is about almost 100 mg per day sleep. And based on her SCVD risk, about 20.5%. So this is the second case. So I will bring back the Q&A session to Doreen. So let's talk about this uh, lady over here. And I think that she is already on a tovastatin at 40 milligrams daily. So I think the main question we want to talk about is whether what is this suitable LDL goal for this patient? How many on this panel are going to say as low as possible? Hands up. <laughs> okay, so that question doesn't need to be answered anymore, right? Um, essentially, uh, the other related question is this. If inclusin is so effective, why can't we just use it as the monotherapy and a first-line drug for all our patients rather than going on statins? Uh, has there been good evidence uh, with other combination agents like uh, azetamide as well? Chris, what do you think? Uh, well, I think... Uh... I would say, based on the clinical trials, that I can imagine in such a future that you will give uh, to a patient like this woman in Clisiran in monotherapy. But uh, according to guidelines, of course, we, we have to use statin in such patients, especially patients with a very high risk profile with uh, 20 years uh, of diabetes. And therefore, the next step for me in clinical practice would be adding uh, to atorvastatin another drug. And this drug could be in Clisiran, because when I add azetamide to this lady, to this uh, atorvastatin, I will not uh, achieve LDL goal. She has, uh, as we have seen, 100 milligrams uh, uh, LDL on atorvastatin, 40 milligrams. So even if I add in Clisiran, she will have another 50% reduction. So he will, uh, she will have an LDL below 55. And this is the LDL that she should uh, have. In fact, I, I, I think this second case doesn't differ from the first case as far as the LDL goal is concerned. Because in this lady, even in primary prevention, uh, with uh, such very high risk diabetes, she should have LDL below 55 uh, milligrams per milliliter. Uh, so in fact, uh, I will go uh, with uh, statin plus inclisiran. Thank you, Chris. So um, maybe we can talk about the effect of inclusiran on the other lipid uh, subfractions like lipo lipoprotein little a and maybe HDL. Does anyone have experience with that, Alberto? Uh, I, I think the, the intervention in the PCSK9, uh, I, I, I have experience with uh, monoclonal antibodies uh, in the reduction of uh, uh, cholesterol redman in this kind of patients. Uh, I mean, for example, this patient is very interesting to see the non-HDL cholesterol in her because she's a, a diabetic patient. In, in this case also, I agree with Dr. Filipiak that the goal of LDL could be less than 55 at the, and the goal of non-HDL 
could be less than 85 milligrams per deciliter. And the patient has uh, nowadays uh, 150 uh, milligrams per, per deciliter in terms of non-HDL. I, I have calculated the, the cholesterol Redman uh, and is uh, around 30. I think this kind of intervention uh, could be positive in terms of reduction of other uh, lipoproteins, uh, mainly lipoproteins that, that contains cholesterol. In these patients, BLDL is enriched by uh, cholesterol and also, as everybody knows, LDL is enriched uh, with triglyceride, if, and for this reason, this kind of patient used to have uh, a, a high proportion of uh, small and dense LDL. Uh, in summary, I, I think I agree with Dr. Filipiak. This is a, a patient uh, uh, that we will add inclusion to, to a statin, and I foresee an interesting effect uh, on others lipoproteins like VLDL Renman and uh, cholesterol Renman that is present in all atherogenic lipoproteins. Thank you, Alberto. Bernard, what do you think about the efficacy of Inclusarin if we wanted to save money and instead of doing the six monthly injection, we do it once a year? What, what are your thoughts about that? <laughs> My goodness. Uh, well, I mean, in, in, in the early trials, it was given more often than six months. Uh, I, I, I think I would stick to um, uh, two injections a year. That's already much, much less frequent than, let's say, um, if the patient goes on PCSK9. Um, but going back to the patient, I can't remember, Doreen, can you remind me whether the patient has been starting on Zetamibe on top of the atorvastatin or not? Nope, she's just on atorvastatin alone. Yeah, so I think that, again, it's a, it might be a very cost-effective option uh, if she's already taking a statin then uh, to add uh, zetamibe to it, and then add either PCSK9 or Enclisaran. PCSK9 has the, uh, it, about in, in real world, about the same uh, uh, cost, um, but obviously more injections, but then it's got the slight advantage of, of you know, more outcome uh, trials. So uh, I think it's a 50-50, I think in future, um, pe uh, patients are moving or, or doctors are moving uh, to use Inclisaran in instead of uh, instead of PCSK9 inhibitors, but I think at, at the present moment it's it's sort of you know neck to neck. Uh, what, what's your, what's the other question, Doreen? Uh, I, I think it was about the stretching out of the uh, the regime. Oh, right, 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 have... right, right. Yeah, right. I, I wonder what uh, what uh, uh, Alberto or or Christoph um, feel about you know stretching out because of the high costs. Uh, injecting it less frequently. Chris or Bernard well, uh, or Alberto, I'm sorry. Well, I, I think we, we must stick to the registration and the registration is uh, every six months. And even if you uh, uh, remember some clinical practice, we are saying that even after the first jab, uh, you should give the second after four or five months. So after the second jab, you are giving every half a year. But the first jab is a little less uh, efficient. Uh, and uh, in, well, it, uh, in my clinical practice, I have few patients on Enclisiran, and the second jab was given after five months. So even the cost of treatment in the first year is a little higher than in the second and third year. So we must remember about it. Thank but, you, Chris. Uh, Alberto? I would like to, to point out uh, the thing that, for example, if, if you, we have uh, more than 20 or near 30 years of experience with, with a statin, what's the, the, main, the main problem in clinical practice with a statin? Muscle symptoms? Not. Uh, secondary effect? Not. The main problem is adherence. In clinical practice is adherence. Uh, you prescribe after the coronary care unit, uh, for example, 80 milligrams uh, per day of atorvastatin, and six months later, the patient is on 20. I don't know why, but it's on 20 <laughs> or on 40. Uh, uh, 
but increasing and is is an excellent opportunity for adherence two shots a year and it's uh, uh, true that uh, dr Philippak pointed out regarding the the first year you you the first shot after uh, the, the the second would be uh, three months later than the first one or five months later and anyway but uh, beside that two shots uh, in a year is a very very interesting option in terms of adherence and effectiveness also 50 percent of ldl reduction with this intervention in a year is really really impressive in my point of view Yes, I agree. Um, I think we have an interesting question here. Uh, the question is, do we have to examine PCSK9 variants before deciding to give Inclusiran to our patients? Anyone? No, we don't have, we don't need that. I mean, uh, uh, in clinical trials, we were not doing it also. And uh, a drug is really very, very effective. So in, in, in fact, there's no need for such uh, I think I maybe I would consider it uh, in a patient in which, for example, after giving in and there were no answer, but I haven't come across such a patient. Thank you, Chris. Kritin, what is it like in Thailand? In Singapore, I think a lot of our lay public is very worried about statins when they start when they're told they need to start on the statins, right? And so they will have all sorts of reasons to say they don't want to start on the statin, they'll go on sorts of uh, diet therapies and they keep delaying starting on, on statins. What is your experience like in, in Thailand? Is that the same? Yeah, I think it's quite the same because when patients got like a heart attack, uh, they got like h statin, 40 milligrams, but after their LDL quite controlled, so they may refer back to the primary care. And then at the primary care, some physicians start to reduce the dose of the statin. Or sometimes the internet. After a patient got some news from the internet, oh, my, uh, my muscle got pain. Yes. <laughs> okay, so I stopped the statin. So yes. I think a big so had the I same problems. I agree with you. So I think uh, earlier Alberto mentioned about compliance. I was going to say that sometimes it's the doctors that cause a non-compliance too, because sometimes your patients complain a little bit and then usually the, the resistance on the side of the, the, the doctors would be, okay, okay, if you're not happy about it, let's cut the dose. And I feel like the, the tolerance to cut the dose or to switch or to stop is actually quite low for statins. And it's somehow because people complaining about muscle aches and pains and everything else. Um, but we do admit that the use of inclusion is going to be a lot more um, convenient for patients, especially if you're worried about of, um, adherence and because you can give one jab every six months, that would actually improve uh, adherence a lot as well. Well, I think we're going to come to the end of our session soon. Maybe I'll go around the panel to ask everyone. I think there were questions about whether you think uh, inclusion will become part of the bundle of post-ACS care and all that as well. So maybe we can hear your views. If you were a member of the Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee, and you had to vote on adding inclusion into your formulary. What would you say to adding inclusion to your formulary? Maybe you can go around the room. Uh, we'll, we'll ask Chris first. What do you think? Well, I, I, I would vote for, for it. But uh, I must say that in my country, for example, we have uh, some problems with inclusion because we have some uh, uh, kind of reimbursement only on uh, monoclonal antibodies. So for alirocumab and evolucumab, not for inclisiran. So in some patients, especially in familial hypercholesterolemia and in a very high risk patients after myocardial infarction, there's a special program of reimbursement of uh, PCSK9 modulation, but without inclisiran. But I hope uh, that it will uh, change uh, in a year. Um, what about Bernard? What do you think? Well, I mean, this is this is not a hypothetical question. This is a question that you know I uh, was part of a committee we had to uh, to to discuss, um, and the uh, our feelings were. I mean, I think the, the downside. Well, there are two downsides to inclusion. One is it's uh, the expense, and the second is uh, the um, the lack of uh, long term outcome data. Um, however, we when we're deliberating, we 
considered that, you know, um, very often you'll be using it on top of statin and enzetimibe. So at least the patient, you know, has, has some uh, uh, cost-effective evidence-based treatment. And only if they don't reach target uh, would you um, use Inclisiran. So I think we, we, you know, we thought it's true and decided that it's worthwhile to include in the formulary, not, obvi not obviously as a first-line drug for everyone yet, uh, but but in selected patients, high risk patients, we felt that you know there was a need for this. Thank you. What about Critin? Would you have voted for Inclisiran in your formulary? Uh, in Thailand, we could not re reimbursement for both PCSK9 or Inclisiran. So uh, if I have to choose one, uh, based on our patient habit. I will be worth for the Inclisiran because I know they don't like to come to hospital frequently. Thank you. Uh, lastly, Alberto, what do you think? Yes, Would you uh, vote uh, for in Inclisiran? Yes, Inclisiran has just arrived in, in my country. Uh, I think it's a, an excellent drug and very, not, not only very effective, just uh, I hope it would be affordable. That, that, that's the problem that we have had with the PCSK9 monoclonal antibody. I definitely uh, will vote uh, in favor of uh, include this, this drug in, the, in, a, in our uh, biomech. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you, everyone. Maybe I'll just sum up the whole conversation this evening with uh, three key points. I think we've heard this evening that Inclusion has a very unique mechanism of action. It is so safe that we literally don't see very many of the adverse drug reactions that we've seen with some of the monoclonal antibodies, as pointed out by Chris earlier. And uh, so Inclusion has been quite well tolerated. Uh, however, because it's uh, in terms of cost, it's going to cost quite a lot. However, what I've heard is also in our local setting, in certain settings, it might be a bit more affordable than the PCSK9 inhibitors. So Singaporeans, listen hard. <laughs> um, if I were to vote for it, I think I would probably also have it in a formulary. Um, the, the other point that we've heard this evening is because of the, the, the long interval of injections, it would be helpful for people who are non-compliant and you don't really have to have them come back so often. Um, as opposed to PCSK9 inhibitors, it requires self-injections. Um, that would not be so good for patients who are afraid of needles on their own. Uh, whereas for the Inclisiran, you can get the patients to come back every six months to get an injection given by a nurse. And therefore, that would increase uh, the compliance to use of Inclisiran. So I think there were a couple of questions about cost effectiveness. Inclisiran is still lacking cardiovascular outcomes with respect to longer term studies. But we know that it's uh, in the pipeline and we all are uh, all hoping with a lot of bated breath to see how well it does. And of course, with a lot of the theories that go before, we know that lowering the LDL would always be um, corresponding with better uh, CV outcomes as well. And therefore, we know that eventually, once that is shown, that we could show cost effectiveness with respect to the use of Inclisiran too. All right. I think that's all the time we have for this evening. I think this was a very rich discussion. Thank you, experts from all over the world. We have Chris from Poland. We have Alberto. We have got Bernard. And then we've also got Critin. So this was a wonderful around the world discussion this evening. So I'd like to remind everyone that the proceedings this evening will be very shortly available on demand on the Radcliffe Cardiology website at www.radcliffecardiology.com. So please go there to watch again. And for those of you who are are very supportive of the ICP work, you can go onto the ICP website and sign up to be a member because we have a lot of these nice short webinars that are useful for you at your demand. Before we go, I'd like to thank our faculty once again. And if you'd like to get your points uh, for CME credits, please don't forget to submit your details at the bottom of the webpage to claim your certificates. With that, we will close the session for this evening. We thank you for your very active participation and the nice questions that you've posed to us. With that, a very good evening from Singapore, a good morning uh, to the USA friends, and a good afternoon to our European friends. Farewell. We'll see you again in August for our next edition of A to Z. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you.